brought her lecture, Short Skirts, Oh My, The History of Women's Rights in America. When Abigail Adams begged her husband to remember the ladies in drafting a new code of laws, John wrote back that he could not but laugh at her extraordinary suggestion. Less than 150 years later, women were working, voting, and experiencing the first taste of freedoms unheard of just a generation earlier. This lecture will trace the exciting social and historical milestones in the fight for women's rights. Let's give a nice warm welcome for Anne. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, welcome everybody tonight. It's a pleasure to be here in Chelmsford. I spent, actually, when I was much younger, I worked for Wang Laboratories. Oh, I did too. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time in Chelmsford. I got my hair cut here. I, went gro I, I did my first grown-up grocery shopping here, <laughs> right down the road. <laughs> so the 1920s represented an exciting new time for women, with new freedoms and opportunities so greatly expanded from anything that women had experienced before that could not have been imagined by their grandmothers or possibly even their mothers. In the 1920s, conservative opinion proclaimed loudly that women had changed, become something completely different from what they had ever been before. Women, they said, were at the vortex of a fiery revolution, part of the new flaming youth. They bobbed their hair, shortened their skirts, carried flasks in their garters, and danced to the wee hours of the morn. In general, they thumbed their noses at the dull conventional worlds of their mothers and turned their backs on old American virtues. That's what conservative opinion said about women. Now, these are easy generalizations that have been passed down to us. We all know the flapper. But like all such sweeping characterizations, they are only part of the story. One essential correction to this, this view of the out of control 1920s female, was that it was not all that sudden. American women did not suddenly start to make themselves over, uh, perhaps because of the rumble seat and its purported uses. Uh, nor was it the consequence of the 19th Amendment. American women had been changing for decades. Yes, as we got closer to 1920, the changes were picking up in speed. But American women had been changing for decades and really searching for a new place for themselves in the social fabric of American society. So tonight we're going to journey through the decades leading up to that time. And we're going to start back at a time when skirts were long and opportunities were short. And women had very traditional roles. In 1776, Abigail Adams is known to have written to her husband, John, who was then attending the Continental Congress. And she said, I long to hear that you have declared an independence. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose that you will be obliged to write, I desire that you would remember the ladies and be more favorable than, to them and more generous than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power in the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. John wrote back, as to your extraordinary code of laws, I cannot but laugh. But John also went on in that letter to more or less admit that women already had a very important, if kind of behind the scenes role. And as a matter of fact, he more or less said why would we codify that which is already really essentially true? Rights for women were exceedingly limited. Until the Married Woman's Property Act of 1848, a woman could not control her own wealth or her own income 
even income, wealth that had belonged to her prior to marriage, as soon as she married, control of her wealth, of any income, of her very person, of the person and well-being of any children she had by a previous marriage, all of that control passed to her new husband. And too many women, unfortunately, discovered belatedly that their new husbands were more interested in their wealth than in their persons. Of course, there were always exceptions. As a single woman of property in Maryland in the mid-18th century, Margaret Brent, pictured on the left in this woodcut depiction, uh, she filed suit against her debtors. Uh, and she also represented her brother's legal requirements in courts as well. She was wealthy, she was powerful, uh, she was very controversial as well. There were probably other women like this here and there who just passed from history and we will never know anything more about them. In 1756, Lydia Taft became the first woman in America to be given the right to vote. She lived in Uxbridge, Massachusetts, and her husband and her son had both died, leaving her a woman of property. So she petitioned the town, and the town agreed to allow her to vote. Deborah Sampson, pictured on the right here, she was from Plimpton, Massachusetts, and she approached the um, challenge of being a woman in a man's world in a different way. She bound herself up and donned a uniform and presented herself for military duty in the Revolutionary War as Robert Shirtleff. She escaped detection despite the fact that she was injured three times and it wasn't until she contracted brain fever that the attending doctor discovered her secret but rather than divulge it he had her move to more private quarters where she can convalesce and she received a soldier's pension at the uh, conclusion of the war. Again, there were women like that here and there, and probably more that we have, have never, and probably unfortunately, sadly, never will hear of. Education for women took place in their homes or on a very limited basis in schools. And I say very limited because, for example, Susan B. Anthony attended school but was denied many subjects because of her gender. A woman was educated with an eye to her future role, uh, both as a household administrator, so reading and writing, clearly we all know that also reading was important because everybody needed to be able to read the Bible. Uh, and also some basic figuring. She also would be providing a rudimentary and initial education for her children. Then, based upon the family's social and economic status, the boys might go on to further schooling. We're all familiar with the uh, the samplers, like the one pictured here, samplers were a way for girls to both learn their letters and numbers as well as practice that very important skill that they would need in life, needlework, fine needlework. It would later be written that the history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. Limited education had historically been a large part of this tyranny. However, in 1821, the Troy Female Seminary, the first endowed school for women, was established by Emma Willard in Troy, New York. Emma Willard was already an accomplished educator and ed education administrator when she wrote a pamphlet entitled A Plan for Improving Female Education in which she laid out all the reasons she felt that improving female education would be better for all of society. She petitioned the state of New York for funds to establish a school but was denied. But 
the city of Troy raised $4,000 and agreed to establish such a school if Emma would come and run it, which she did. The education offered was comparable to the college preparatory courses offered to young men and boys of the time. Uh, it included natural philosophy and trigonometry and chemistry and zoology. Uh, Emma knew that some of her students, probably many of her students, would also go on to manage homes. So she also offered courses in home management and home economics and such. If, a, if, the, if the curriculum, she, she wrote all of her own curriculum, and if in her curriculum she could not find a book that would, met her standards, she would write them herself. And I actually have one here. that I happened to have in my library. I didn't, I didn't go out and get this, it just was in my library. My family has a lot of old books that passed from generation to generation, and this was among them. This is The Abridged History of the United States of the Republic of America by Emma Willard, 1845. So this is one of the books that she created for her school. The Troy Female Seminary became a model for the comprehensive education of women. And it also proved that women could study and excel in all subjects, which before that, many did not believe. Even as late as 1873, Dr. Edward Clark wrote in his Sex and Education book, a girl can study and learn, but she cannot do this all and retain uninjured health and a future secure from neuralgia, uterine disease, hysteria, and other derangements of the nervous system. Ladies, have you had any of those <laughs> problems from your education? In 1833, Oberlin College became the first coeducational college in the United States. Uh, and as we all know, education, is power, and pe women were making the first steps towards gaining power and influence. At about that same time, in publishing the, uh, a book, The Course of Popular Lectures, Fanny Wright became one of the first women to actually write about the idea of suffrage, of, wim of, of women being able to vote. She was from Scotland and she had moved to the United States to move a socialist colony on a land that she had purchased in Tennessee that was based upon a socialist colony that she had observed in Indiana. Uh, she was a correspondent. She was a guest of such luminaries as Thomas Jefferson and the Marquis de Lafayette. Uh, she was the first woman to edit a journal, the Harmony Gazette, and she was the first woman to hold a series of lectures before both men and women. Women were prevented from making public address, and certainly public address, before a mixed audience. That was unheard of. Some aspects of Wright's community were very controversial, uh, especially her decision to encourage sexual freedom. Wright saw marriage as a discriminatory institution and advocated for free love way before the 1960s. She also developed her own dress code for women uh, that consisted of long pantalettes, ankle length pantalettes, a shorter knee length skirt, and a short bodice. In her book, she wrote, however novel it may appear, I shall venture the assertion that until woman assumes the place in society which good sense and good feeling alike assign to them, human improvement must advance but feebly. It is in vain that we would circumscribe the power of one half of our race, and that half by far the most important and influential. In 1840, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott met at an international anti-slavery convention in London, where they were outraged when the men of the assembly voted to prevent women attendees 
from speaking at the assembly. Not only were they pre prevented from speaking, but a, a section was cordoned off behind a curtain so that they could watch the proceedings but not be seen. Now these women were actually sent as delegates and yet were still prevented from participating in any way. This experience galvanized these two women into taking further action regarding women's rights. In 1848, the first women's rights convention in the United States was held in Seneca Falls, New York, organized by Stanton, Mott, and uh, some other women. Many of the participants signed, signed the Declaration of Rights and sen uh, Sentiments and Resolutions that outlined the main issues and goals for the emerging women's movement. And I want to share just a little bit of that document. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted deriving their powers from the consent of the governed. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these rights, it is the right of those who suffer from it to refuse allegiance to it and to insist upon the institution of a new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Such has been the patient sufferance of the women under this government and such is now the necessity which constrains them to demand the equal station to which they are entitled. The history of man is a history of repeated injuries and usurpation on the part of man toward woman having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has not ever permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise. He has compelled her to submit to laws in the formation of which she had no voice. He has withheld from her rights which are given to the most ignorant and degraded men. Having deprived her of this first right as a citizen, the elective franchise, thereby leaving her without representation in the halls of legislation, he has oppressed her on all sides, on all sides. He has taken from her all right and property, even to the wages she earns. And so it goes on. This convention marked the beginning of regularly held women's rights meetings. Women acting, organizing themselves and acting independently, it, it's hard for us to imagine today, or maybe it's not. Um, but this was a new concept. Women organizing or doing anything without direct permission and knowledge of men was just a completely new concept. To compare, for example, I have this little, uh, this is a picture of this little book that I have in my hand here. It's basically an advice book. This book was published in 1848, the same year of the Women's Convention. It focuses on the proper behavior of women. Because up until that time, with the exception of some of the women that we've talked about, the breakaway women, basically a woman's appearance reputation and behavior were all she could trade on to get her by in the world. For example, according to this little book, a lady's behavior in the street should be modest, dignified, yet pleasant and engaging. Never stare, never giggle, never walk with a wriggle or sway from side to side. Ladies are not a allowed upon any ordinary occasion to take the arm of a, anyone but a male relative or a, an accepted suitor. Any question posed by a stranger before, beyond the most necessary of questions should be considered a gross insult and repelled with proper spirit. The Civil War disrupted many suffragist activities as women turned their energies towards war work. 
They served as nurses, as fundraisers, as spies, even a few in disguise as soldiers, as had happened also in the Revolutionary War. They were also running households and businesses and farms single-handedly while their husbands and sons and fathers were away for months or years during the war. But the war work provided a training ground for many women to learn organizational and occupational skills. For example, Clara Barton took what she learned during the war to help her found the American Red Cross. Many more women would take what they had learned and in that terms of that gained knowledge and confidence and competence and uh, turn it towards suffrage activities. In 1870, the 15th Amendment gave the right to vote to the black male population. Disagreement over this amendment caused a split in the American Equal Rights Association that had formed in 1866. That association was, was really set upon getting universal suffrage, so suffrage for black men and also white and black women. So, Stanton and Anthony formed the National Women's Suffrage Association. It's said that these two were a very powerful team. They didn't always agree or get along on everything, uh, but they were a very powerful and forceful team. Uh, Anthony was a great writer, and Stanton was a great orator. Lucy Stone from Massachusetts, along with some others, organized the Boston-based American Women's Suffrage Association. Lucy Stone attended Oberlin College and uh, was the first woman in Massachusetts to earn a college degree. She was asked to write the commencement speech, but she declined the honor because a male would have had to have deliver her speech. Uh, it, many, many years later, not too long before her death, uh, Oberlin asked her to come and make a commencement speech. In 1850, Stone was the leader in organizing the first National Women's uh, Convention, which was held in Worcester, Massachusetts. Now, um, the, first, the first conference that we already talked about was in 1848, but that was a local convention. This was a national convention. Uh, and Lucy Stone also is remembered for uh, another first. She was the first woman to keep her maiden name after marriage. And she lived, I believe, in Cambridge. And Cambridge gave women uh, the vote for school committee members, but Cambridge refused to allow her to vote unless she assumed her, unless she voted under her married name with her husband's name. While we're talking about Massachusetts women, um, Victoria Claflin Woodhull pictured on the left, uh, her family, the Claflin family, was from uh, Wenham, Massachusetts. She, um, she was a very colorful figure in the latter part of the 19th century. Uh, she was a spiritualist, an actress. She formed the first all-women's stock brokerage. Uh, she was an advocate of free love. And she also ran for president, kind of. She didn't meet the minimum age requirement. Uh, she didn't make it onto any state ballots, but she did do some campaigning, and she did technically run in, in some ways. Uh, who really did run was Belva Lockwood, pictured here on the right. Belva Lockwood ran in 1884. She campaigned. She crisscrossed the country. She um, made speeches. And she made it onto several state ballots and earned over 4,000 votes. She ran again in 1888 with less success. In 1874, the Women's Christian Temperance Union formed, and in addition to becoming a powerful voice against the evils of liquor, the organization was also an important force in the fight for suffrage. The liquor industry did not want women to win the vote. 
because they were afraid that if they did win the vote that they would outlaw liquor consumption. In 1878, a woman's suffrage amendment was introduced in the United States Congress but did not pass. It's interesting to note, though, that some states gave some suffrage to women on certain points um, well before actual universal suffrage came along. I mentioned earlier that uh, Lucy Stone and the Cambridge allowed women to vote uh, for members of the school committee. So if you look here um, on this map, the olive states, women had absolutely no voting rights at all. The light orange states, women could vote in the presidential election. In the dark orange states, women could vote um, in the primaries. And in the blue states, women had full suffrage. Notice that the blue states are all out west, and there's probably a couple of reasons for that. First of all, it was the frontier, the opening frontier. Women were um, very important, a very important element in opening up that frontier, and so probably were able to get more uh, rights out there. And also, it's quite possible that some of the states and territories offered it as an incentive. If women came out to help settle, that they would have full suffrage. But suffragists didn't feel that anything short of a constitutional amendment was sufficient to guarantee all women their elective franchise rights. In 1890, the organization that had split in two way back in 1866, well, it reunified under the leadership of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, but she only remained in power for a couple of years. Now, you might think that every woman would have been in favor of women getting the right to vote. But that wasn't true. In 1911, the National Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage was formed by a, coll a collection of wealthy women, wives of industrialists and such, uh, also some Catholic clergymen, uh, some corporate capitalists, uh, and some Southern congressmen. Locally, or fairly locally, in uh, Wenham, uh, the Salem Evening News declared, Wenham women oppose suffrage. I don't know how the Chelmsford women felt. So why would you oppose suffrage? Well, here's what might happen. These were, these were posters and such that would show what would happen if women were given the right to vote. The children's socks need darning. They've run out of lamp oil. There's nothing to eat. The family is a mess because women have won the right to vote. Pamphlets and posters like this were circulated, opposing suffrage. What were some of the reasons? Well, here are some of the reasons why women shouldn't vote. No woman who may vote will attend to her domestic duties, as we've just seen in that poster. It will make dissension between husband and wife. Or conversely, men and women are so much alike that a man can represent a woman's views. Women will vote, a woman will vote as her husband tells her to. Or probably what they were most afraid of, women will form a solid party and outvote men. But this is my favorite. Women have no powers of organization. Despite this, in 1912, Theodore Roosevelt's Progressive Party became the first national political party to adopt a women's suffrage plank uh, in the bid for presidency. Finally, suffragists were making some really big national headway, however, Roosevelt didn't win, Woodrow Wilson won, and he was anti-suffrage. During the early teens, the National Women's Party organized hunger strikes and picketing and such. And at first, the White House just looked the other way, but eventually it got to a point where uh, Wilson just couldn't tolerate it anymore, and many women were uh, jailed where they received really 
highly publicized, poor treatment, forced tube feedings, beatings, and such. It became an embarrassment for the White House, and eventually all those jailed were released. The United States entered World War I in 1917, and almost immediately, the Wilson administration called on women to support the war effort. All over the country, women massed behind the war. Thousands of women volunteered their services. They joined drives to sell Liberty Bonds and War Savings Bonds. They sold them in, at club meetings and in shops and on street corners. Others helped the Red Cross to gather supplies and provide medical supplies and such. Uh, others worked with a number of different voluntary women's organizations that were formed, auxiliary organizations that were formed to support the war effort. Thousands of female volunteers had for the first time the opportunity to wear Red Cross and other uniforms that marked them as persons of influence and skill. And thousands more had the unprecedented opportunity for the first time to enlist in certain positions within the military. During the fall of 1917, the United States Employment Service recognized that thousands of women would have to work in the war industries. Women came out of their homes to do the jobs and provide the services that their country needed. And by the winter of 1917-18, it was clear that women would have to take over jobs that were described and thought of as men's work, such as these women here in this welding facility. Now, in the view of the suffragists, the fact that women were being called upon to support the war in such critical ways just further reinforced the argument to give women the right to vote. The National American Suffrage Association, under the direction of Carrie Chapman Catt, formed a plan to coordinate nationwide suffrage lobbying at the state and federal level. They employed the successful men's tactics of meeting with politicians, uh, and leveraging those in favor to work on people who were not in favor to try to sway them around, um, just all on a national and state level. So really a concerted and coordinated effort. In 1918, Wilson came around to the, their point of view, encouraging the House and Senate to pass the amendment saying, an act, it is an act of right and justice to the women of the country and of the world. But still, it failed to pass. Finally, in 1919, it did pass. But it needed to be ratified by 36 states. 35 states ratified it. And then all eyes turned to Tennessee. Now, as you might remember on that map, Tennessee was one of those olive states. Very conservative women had no franchise rights at all. The vote looked to be extremely tight. And there was a lot of lobbying and fighting back and forth. And it came to be known as the War of the Roses. Uh, delegates who were against suffrage wore red roses. Delegates who were for suffrage wore yellow roses. The swing vote was in question. And it was held by Harry Byrne a young representative, and when I say young, he was about 24 years old at the time. His earlier actions and statements uh, had conflicted, but it seemed likely that since he was young and you know, kind of going along with his party, that he would probably just vote with his party, which would be um, uh, against suffrage. And he might have done just that had it not been for a letter from his mother. Feb Byrne was an independent-minded widow caring for a farm in Tennessee, but she took the time out to read up and stay current on the suffrage movement. And she had said that recent news about uncertainty of the outcome finally compelled her to write to her son vo voicing her sentiments. She wrote, 
Hurrah and vote for suffrage and don't keep them in doubt. I noticed Chandler's speech. It was very bitter. I've been waiting to see how you stood, but not have, have not seen anything yet. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat with her rats. Is she the one that put rat in ratification? Ha! No more from Mama this time. With lots of love, Mama. And so, Tennessee became the 36th state to ratify the amendment. Now I'm uh, often asked, and so I've just put in one little slide, it could be a whole conversation unto itself, but how do we compare, how does the United States compare with other countries? Uh, and so, of course, that's a complex uh, question, but just a few highlights. In the 18th century, Swedish and Polish women who paid taxes were allowed voting rights, although Sweden later rescinded those rights. In the 19th century, Finnish taxpaying women were granted municipal voting rights. And later in 1906, they were among the first to get full elective franchise. Late in, 19, in the 19th century, the women in the UK were granted local voting rights, but they didn't actually get full suffrage until 1928. So many uh, countries came in ahead of the United States, including Poland, Denmark, Austria, uh, New Zealand, and Belgium. Others arrived there after the United States, including the United Kingdom, uh, South Africa, France, uh, and Greece. And so it has continued, even into the 21st century when Oman and Kuwait, uh, finally, those women also gained voting rights. So now, Let's switch gears completely and talk about fashion and its role as an indicator of the transformation. Between 1900 and the mid-20s, the feminine ideal in America underwent a remarkable and complete metamorphosis. At the turn of the century, the Gibson girl defined the age. Uh, the Gibson Girl was named after the illustrator Charles Dana Gibson, and she was defined by long hair swept up, display, displaying a high brow, a narrow waist, well-concealed legs, and a maternal and wifely manner. The Gibson Girl always appeared aloof and seemingly incapable of any immodest or irreligious thought. She was cultured and intelligent, but would not mix in politics and the like. By the 1920s, the Gibson girl had vanished completely, and in her place was the flapper. Quite unlike the Gibson girl, the flapper cut off her hair, concealed her curves, showed as much of her leg as possible, and all wore plenty of makeup, something the Gibson girl would have never dreamed of doing. During the first half of the 20s, skirt length became the boiling point for this new social revolution. Since 1915, skirts had been drifting up slowly until right after our World War I, they were about six to seven inches above the ground. By 1920, all restraint had been thrown to the wind and they were up another five to six inches. And the shorter skirt was not the only development in the change in a women's costume. Everything was being lightened and simplified. There were no more corsets and stays and chemises and underclothes and such. In 1928, the Journal of Commerce declared that the amount of cloth required to make up a woman's costume dropped from 19 and a half yards in 1913 to seven yards in 1928. The 1920s also witnessed an explosion in beauty shops, expanding from 5,000 to 40,000 between 1920 and 1930. Sales of cosmetics in that same period jumped 400%. And in 1921, the first, uh, the, uh, the first Miss America pageant was held. While women's expanding political opportunities contributed to the sense of the new, women, new woman, changes in work were equally important. 
World War I brought short-term opportunities for a variety of jobs for women to, to fill. And in addition, new business technologies like typing and stenography um, increased the number of clerical jobs that were available. Now, traditionally, women had mostly filled blue-collar kinds of factory jobs while they went flocking to these new white-collar jobs that had better pay and more prestige. More than 88,000 women were employed as telephone workers, and by 1977, women accounted for 99% of all switchboard operators. So all this new work and new, new work um, technologies and telephones and such were all opening up opportunities for women. At the turn of the century, young working women had most often lived at home or um, while working, or perhaps if work was too far away, they would board with a family closer to where they were working. In the 1920s, between school and marriage, women were getting apartments with other young women and sharing them and, and, and going out to work. Having their own apartments gave these young women a feeling of autonomy and adulthood and of being unsupervised and unrestrained. It gave their parents a lot of worry, with good reason. Jazz was all the rage. And the newspaper, the New York American, reported, reported its results on the national character saying, moral disaster is coming to hundreds of young American girls through the pathological, nerve-irritating, sex-exciting music of jazz orchestras. In just two years in Chicago alone, alone, according to the Illinois Vigilance Association, the downfall of a thousand girls could be traced directly to the pernicious influence of jazz music. A social worker reported on the unwholesome excitement she now encountered even at small town dances in the Midwest. Boy and girl couples left the hall in a state of dangerous disturbance. Bathtub gin, combined with jumpy jazz music, suggestive couples dancing, and short skirts all led to a new era of relaxed sexual norms. Rudolph Valentino made millions of women swoon, and branded shake condoms, like these here in these little tins, well, they held all the promise of romantic Valentino-esque liaisons. One father of the time described his experience thus. I was sure my girls had never experimented with hip pocket flasks, flirted with other women's husbands, or smoked cigarettes. My wife entertained the same smug delusion and was saying something like that out loud at the dinner table one day. And then she began to talk about a girl my daughter associated with, saying, they tell me that that Purvis girl has cigarette parties at her home. Elizabeth, my daughter, was regarding her mother with curious eyes. She made no reply, but returning to me right there at the table, she said, Dad, let's see your cigarettes. Without the slightest suspicion of what was forthcoming, I threw Elizabeth my cigarettes. She withdrew one from the package, tapped it on the back of her left hand, inserted it between her lips, reached over and took my lighted cigarette and from my mouth lit her own cigarette and blew airy rings toward the ceiling. My wife nearly fell out of her chair and I might have fallen out of mine if I hadn't been momentarily too stunned to do so. Young working women often modeled their behavior on their dreams on the movies. In the 1920s, movie stars replaced uh, business, artistic, or political leaders as the role models for these young women. And ironically, the movies based a lot of their themes on the lives of these working women because they made up a large part of their audience. Films showed office workers and department store clerks working among 
wealthy bosses. And the idea was that if you were, had some looks and some spunk and some smarts, you could marry the boss. In 1928, 39% of college graduates were women, which was up from 19% at the turn of the century. That same year, women began to compete in track and field events at, in the Olympics. Women had not competed in the first Olympics in 1896. The reason being, and I quote, their competition would be impractical, uninteresting, unesthetic, and incorrect. They began competing in 1900 in uh, lawn tennis and golf. Women's swimming was added in 1912, but American women did not compete in that first event because American women were required to wear skirts while competing, and it is very difficult to swim in a skirt. So throughout the 20s, women were enjoying all this new frivolity. Of course, the giddiness of the 1920s couldn't last, and with the stock market crash and the subsequent depression, um, through the 30s, some ground was even lost. Some states passed laws preventing women from taking jobs, feeling that those jobs were being taken away from men. Uh, but at the same time, other uh, progress was made in other places. Frances Perkins became the Secretary of Labor, the first woman cabinet member. Jane Addams became the first woman to earn or to be given the Nobel Peace Prize. And of course, Eleanor Roosevelt completely redefined the role of first lady, uh, became the ambassador to the UN, and did things such as hold a press conference to which only women reporters were invited. Then came World War II, and many women signed up to go overseas, and other women went to work in the war industries and proved that once again they were an integral part of our culture and of our winning ways and of of everything that we held dear as Americans that they were willing to fight for as well. And so we come back around to the foreshadowing words of Abigail Adams when she wrote, if particular attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we had no voice or representation. How right she was. As we've seen the incredible evolution that could have never probably been envisioned or imagined by Abigail, or possibly even those women at that first convention. It was a long road, but with generations, literally, of women and so many hundreds of women, certainly names that we know, but so many more names that have passed from history. They all worked so that women could not only enjoy the elective franchise, but increasingly enjoy freedoms and rights and opportunities that they could only imagine. Thank you. Do you have any questions or discussion? All right, well, thank you then. <laughs> You're just all stunned. <laughs> yes? Yeah. The Scandinavian company, countries that allowed women to vote, you said if they paid taxes, if they did not pay taxes, could they not vote? No, it was, it was basically property owning. But I think that was even the case early on here in, in America, you know, in the very earliest times, I believe that um, you, had to be a, you had to be a person of property, a man of property in order to vote here. I'm not 100% sure, but I, I think that that was the case in, in our very earliest days of our country. Well, thanks very much, everybody. Have a lovely evening.